So now that we understand how to make models of systems using differential equations, and in particular, we've seen a couple of examples, especially the shark tuna example, which we're going to be referring to. I, I want to go on and show three more examples of modeling using differential equations uh, in three examples which have a lot of parallelism to them, which you will find interesting. The first example that I want to talk about is the example of chemical reactions. So what is a chemical reaction? Well, we learn to write a rate law that looks like this. And that's read x plus y goes to z. And sometimes there's a little k up there. Now, what does that mean? Uh, first of all, the thing that we have to emphasize is that that goes to arrow is not a mathematical symbol. It's standing for a physical chemical reaction. So we have to turn this rate law into a differential equation. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing that we have to do is we have to decide what are our state variables. And in this case, we're going to take as our state variable the concentration of x, the concentration of y, and the concentration of z. And to get rid of those, which I'm just going to call those variables x, y, and z, standing for their concentrations. Good. Now the next question, as we make a differential equations model, is we put down our x prime and our y prime and our z prime, and we ask what makes x go up, and we subtract from that whatever makes x go down, and of course the same thing for y and the same thing for z. Now, let's stare at this equation, not equation, excuse me, this rate law, and let's ask ourselves, in this rate reaction, what makes x go up? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> As written here, there is no arrow going into x. And because there's no arrow going into x, Nothing makes x go up, and so that quantity is zero. Now, the next question is, what makes x go down? And the answer is combination with y to make a z. And I'm just going to write that in English. Combination with y to make z. We're going to have to figure out what that is mathematically. What makes y go up? Again, nothing. What makes y go down? Combination with x to make z, similarly. What makes z go up? So let's just put that nothing, and then combination with x to make z. And then what makes z go up is the x's and the y's combining, combination of x and y. And what makes z go down is nothing in this reaction. So we've at least put in words here to represent our differential equation, now we have to figure out some math to express that combination term. So in order to turn that combination of x and y, or x meets y, 
and you may remember that from sharp tuna, x meets y. How can we quantify that? So the first thing we need to do is we need to understand that the argument that we are going to make is essentially an argument using probability. So the first point, the first observation I want to make, we said constant the variable x stands for the concentration of x. I want to stress that what we're talking about with those square brackets, it's not the molarity, the usual concept of molar concentration of the atomic weight and stuff like that. This is what is called the volume concentration in chemistry, and it is simply how much, here is your beaker, and here is the whole volume V, and here are the X molecules. And the question is, what is the volume of the pink dots divided by the volume of the beaker? That is the volume concentration of X, and it's what we're using as the variable. Now, here's the key point. You see some pink dots in the black background, and that the ratio of the pink to the black is the volume concentration. Or rather, the ratio of the pink to the whole thing is the volume concentration. And now I want to ask a question. What is the probability that a random point chosen in the volume will contain an X molecule? What is that probability? Well, it's obvious the probability equals the volume concentration. If I am just blindly picking a point here, and one quarter of the points here are occupied by red dots, then the probability of picking a red dot is 25%. So this is equal to the probability that a small box contains an X. Okay, now let's ask ourselves, what is the probability of finding a Y? Molecule. Well, here are the Y molecules, and it's obvious that the variable Y, which is the volume concentration of Y, is equal to the probability that a small box contains Y, contains a Y. Now, it's very easy to ask the question, what is the probability of an X meeting a Y? And in order to answer that, we go back to a very basic principle of probability theory, which says that if A and B are independent, then the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. So for example, the probability of drawing a red queen from a poker deck that's probably, you have to draw a red card and a queen. So first of all, is redness and queenness independent? Yes, they are. So the probability of drawing a red queen is equal to the probability of drawing 
a red card, which is 50%, times the probability of drawing a queen, which is 13%. So the probability of drawing a red queen is the product of the two of those, or 6.5%. So we know that the probability, and I'm going to leave out the small box containing, the probability of finding x and y is equal to the probability of finding x times the probability of finding y. Now, suppose we're in this little box in the middle of the beaker, and we have an x molecule and a y molecule in that little box. Does it follow that they will chemically combine with each other and the answer is not automatically. There is a certain probability that if x and y are in the same neighborhood as each other, they will actually bind to each other. And in the reaction scheme, x plus y goes to z with this rate constant k. The rate constant is exactly the probability that two molecules in a little box will choose to bind together. So the total probability of x plus y goes to z is therefore how much is subtracted from x is therefore clearly minus x times y times k, or as we usually put it, minus k x y. So now, with this observation, here is our x combines with y term. So now we can write the full differential equation for this specific rate scheme. We can write it as x prime equals minus k x y, y prime equals minus k x y, and z prime equals plus k x y. And we set initial conditions, and this will determine the progress of the chemical reaction. And in this way, we have converted the rate law into a true differential equation. Now, in so doing, you may have heard overtones and analogies to what we said about sharks and tuna. And the answer is the analogy is 100%. We use the phrase chemical species to talk about sodium and chloride going to sodium chloride. We call those chemical species. And they're exactly like animal species. And so the simple law here that says that we have a lot of x's and a lot of y's, and they bump into each other or not. And when they do bump into each other, they have a probability k of meeting why, that's exactly sharks and tuna. And you remember the term in the tuna prime equation that was minus beta st. Well, that is this term. And what was beta? Beta was the likelihood that a shark tuna interaction results in a binding, that is, in the coupling of the shark and the tuna to the detriment of the tuna. But the model is the same, and they're both based upon what in chemistry is called the law of mass 
action, which says basically that all of the species here, x and y and z, are independent of each other. In particular, it cannot be the case that the solution is so dense, is so crowded, that the x's and y's can't freely diffuse with respect to each other. Because if they can't freely diffuse with respect to each other, then the probability argument breaks down. Because if the x's can form a little wall and wall off the y's so that they can't diffuse through the fluid, then the whole probability argument breaks down. So we're assuming that x is independent from y, that they're both dilute enough that there's no crowding effect of the x's with themselves or the x's with the y's or the y's with themselves. But it also can't be too dilute. Because if it were one X molecule down here and one Y molecule up there, you could wait an awfully long time for them to fall into the same area. And this argument would also break down. But in that intermediate range of not too dilute and not too concentrated, the law of mass action applies. And it is essentially the same as shark tuna dynamics. In fact, you can write the shark tuna scenario as a goes to reaction. For example, you can write S plus T goes to 2S. And that is a reaction in which S and T combine. And of course, the K there is going to be beta. So what does this rate law say? It says that S prime equals minus beta ST because you are going to lose a shark here and gain two over there. So I'm sorry, that should be a plus, not a minus. Shark prime is equal to beta ST because you lose a shark from the left, you gain two sharks on the right, that's a net gain of a shark at a rate beta ST. And similarly, the other terms of the shark tuna model, uh, I wrote them down, uh, now we have to write the tuna expression and we can write T, let me write it over here, T goes to 2T. So that says that T prime equals T. You lose one, you gain two. But T prime also equals minus beta ST in our differential equation. And then lastly, the last rate law we need is shark goes to dead shark, or shark just goes to the cloud. And that's, of course, going to be S prime equals, and this is a death rate D. And so that is going to be minus DS. And if we add up these terms, we get the shark tuna model. So the shark tuna model and the chemical species meet and bind with each other is exactly the same underlying dynamics, and it gives exactly the same type of differential equation. So that's how to take x plus y goes to z and turn it into a differential equation. Let's take a little bit more complicated example now. Let's include a back reaction. So x plus y is going to go to z, and the k there is going to be k forward. And then z <coughs> is going to dissociate back into x and y. And that is a rate at a rate constant with a rate constant of kb. <coughs> so now again, we make the differential equation. What makes x go up now has an entry. What makes x go up 
is the dissociation of z into x and y, and that takes place at a rate kb. So now we have a plus term here, and that plus term is kb times z. Same minus term for the forward reaction, which is k forward times x times y. Similarly, y prime is equal to kb times z minus kfxy. And z prime is now going to be plus kfxy minus kbz. So here is a nice set of differential equations. And you might ask, well, how does this help in our understanding of the chemistry, of the chemical dynamics? And the answer is we can do a very simple and very cool thing. And this anticipates really what is our next big dynamics subject. So this is a differential equation model. It's going to predict some kind of trajectory. We don't offhand know what it is, but we can make one observation. And I want to think of the very special case in which x prime equals zero, which is also known as equilibrium. So at chemical equilibrium, these, con these quantities are not changing grossly. And so x prime equals zero, and it is said to be in chemical equilibrium. And we're going to be studying equilibrium points of differential equations, a huge subject. But this is our first example of one. And we can just stare at the top line there and say, well, if x prime is 0, then 0 equals kb times z minus kf times xy. Let's drop that, make those two equal. Let's divide both sides by z and divide both sides by k forward. And now we get KB over KF equals XY over Z. In other words, we can derive from the differential equation what is called the law of chemical equilibrium, which is that at equilibrium, the ratio of these quantities, x, y, and z, they will stand in the ratio kb over kf. And that's an important fundamental principle from elementary chemistry.